Donut Head to come on the show. The, I'm fucking, I'm oh, that's stoked. Crazy. Yeah, I got a lot of love. I got a lot of love for all of you out there from Arizona. Because, ooh, this had to be 2017 status. It was around the time my son was born. Um, It was in... I want to say her name is Peyton. Yeah. Pey- um, she came out. She battled Yaya at the Beast Camp. Ronnie battled Kid, the old Kid Beast, Gabe. And then I think there was. Were you there that night? 2017. I would not have been there. There was somebody. I swear there was somebody else out there. I'm not sure though. But um, I was like, oh my god, I was like, Arizona's fucking tight, dude. You guys are lit out here. Let's go. I think that was before I even got into the scene, honestly. Mm. Okay, so hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's start there. First off, this is the smoking section. Thank you coming to the show, Steph. <laughs> but um, when did you when did you get into Crump? When did you first step into the scene? And I, it had to be twenty eighteen. Okay. Because I became an end in twenty nineteen. Oh. And and how did that come about? How did you find the scene around that time? Well, I danced with Jukebox, so I danced with Ronnie and basically everyone in and Sam, just not in Crump. And then I saw Rhino and Julian battle. Mm. And, it... and then just kind of went from there? Yeah. Then I got connected with Ronnie and like really started training. And did you, did you like take classes first or were you somebody who was like a session bug and just kind of like hung out at the sessions and learned that way? No, I took classes. I mean, I did both. So Mm. because I was on jukebox, like crump classes were almost a requirement anyways. So I did those and did privates with Ronnie and sessions and labs and then just kind of took off from there. Ah, interesting. And so when would have been, do you remember when your first battle was? I feel like I got battled all the time. So I don't (laughs) even know. Like every time I showed up to something, I was either being battled or passed out. Well, there you go. That's, yeah, Yeah. that's the way to learn, huh? Yeah, I mean, you learn fast. Um, And Ronnie's already in here. Ronnie, dude, I need you to answer your messages, bro. Okay, I need you up on here. We got dead infam in the building. Yep. And then, so you were already dancing with Jukebox was like hip hop choreo or like what would have been your, I guess, your first introduction to dance then? Uh, cheerleading. I went from cheer to like Kong, which is the dance version of cheer. Do jukebox, which is choreo in all realms, hip hop. Uh, they do all styles, and then mm-hmm. in the crump. And crump is the only thing that I've touched for like freestyle of dance. Mm. So. Yeah, there's something. It, it seems like every, and I guess it's kind of redundant to say, but it's like every crumper seems to, once they find it, it like it just has a has a certain grip on us, you know. Yeah, it definitely does. So about four years now, right? So let's say like roughly like between four to five years of crumping. Yeah. What, what would you say has been like one of your one of your favorite moments? Because I seen you at the get off in Oceanside and you were getting off. So I was like, hey, yo, uh, what would you say would be like one of your favorite moments that you've had so far? Uh, I think my favorite moment don't necessarily have to even do with like battles but just being around the people in the dance because we've had really great moments as a donut community we've had moments with the get off out in cali going to seattle so i think it's more so like the community aspect versus the battle aspect Hmm. honestly yeah those people uh the people you meet along the way you know what i mean and those friendships you pick up some of them for sure yeah like uh, like I was just talking with Casey, you know, Huncho, and I just so happened to be plugged in with him because I was in San Antonio working and tapped in and tapped in with so many different people and ended up 
where he was and you know now now it's big bro what up bro every time i see him you know dapping up and and bullshitting you know on the side and having yeah. a good laugh and stuff um and so building community five years coming out of zona and then i seen recently too you were asked to judge an event yeah uh seven to smoke at mad hatter it's a jukebox event what was that like it was cool uh it's weird judging events uh, it was my first time judging an event. Um, it was a lot of pressure. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about judging personally, uh, but it was a like a dope experience, especially with the Zona community more than anything. Why would you say that though? Why would it be, why to you, why is it weird? I think or a, a lot of pressure to, to be a judge. Uh, because my, I have to give my opinion about things. Oh my gosh. Like I have to choose. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm really <laughs> opinionated, but to put it out there like that, like, I just don't do that as much. Do you feel like your words aren't received as well, or do you feel like maybe there's a questioning of your own judgment? Um, Almost neither. Mm. Like, I'm very solid in my decisions and, like, my opinions and things. Like, I don't really feel the need to give it out. More than mm. anything. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I mean, I have judged before. And I realized, like, yeah, that's not my gig. That's just not something I'm really into. Uh, I'm super biased when it comes to what I like when I see somebody dancing. Like, and it does kind of suck to judge somebody's artwork, you yeah. know, like your self-expression is you and it's valuable it, valuable just because it's you and it's what you're yeah. doing but i definitely like what i like and and i'm gonna vote that way like i'm really it's right. really hard for me to be um sub yeah subjective in those times yeah i guess i'm more so just like being around it than being like the person like in it like in it in it yeah yeah yeah, I uh, I was even telling I was telling some of the boys here recently because um, I'm in Ohio right now mm -hmm. and I got to go hang out and be at the dungeon. And, you know, Moody was like, corpse, when you go to dance, man, you dance. I'm like, no, I'm just here to bro, I'm just here to spectate. I just want to fucking yeah. watch for once, please. Like every Tuesday at the beast camp, I would have to battle every Wednesday when I was dancing under dread. I was battling and I just never got to just enjoy and cheer and just kind yeah. of observe you know yeah no you have to dance there though that was a cool experience dancing there we're at the at the camp or at the at the yeah. at moody's oh yeah oh yeah yeah his basement i'm trying to get to the basement and i heard that place is like yes hyperbolic time that's chamber. what i'm talking about yeah the basement Mm-hmm. You've been? Mm-hmm. When we went out for Brutal City. Oh, nice. Nice. Did you battle while you were out here? Yes. Ooh, who'd you uh, battle? Lil Rex. Little Rex. Oh, yes, Ronnie. One of the best places. Yes. I like Ohio. Shout out Ohio. Yeah. These, guys, these dudes out here have welcomed me with open arms and uh, have made sure that I'm included on everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're some of the best people, in my opinion, that I've been around in Crump. Yeah, everywhere. The Midwest, to me, have been some of the funniest people I've been around. Like, like Herb is just unintentionally funny. And so is Moody, just unintentionally funny. Mm -hmm. uh, no one, just unintentionally funny. Just That's just who they are, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Um, They're good people. And, oh, so damn! You've been you've been able to get out and about a little bit in your in your crump yeah. tenure. Yeah. Where would you say you've been your like favorite place that you've been? So that depends on how you look at it, right? Because no disrespect to anybody in Cleveland, but like going back to Cleveland is not it for me, but the people there are some of my favorite and the experience there was my favorite. 
but like Cleveland itself is not my place. <laughs> um, House of Crowns in Seattle was really cool. That was a great experience, but I was in a bad mood that weekend. So I didn't get to fully experience it because I had just torn my ACL. So it was like uh... a different vibe for me. I really haven't had a bad experience anywhere I've went personally. So I don't know. If you could book a ticket somewhere right now to go dance, where would you go? I wouldn't go anywhere. Zona. Hey. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. Talk your shit, Zona. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, that's and I wanted I did want to talk about that and I hoped and I was I was hoping to see how I could swing into it. So you how long has it been since you had that injury? I <laughs> Tore my ACL in January of 2020, and then I had mm. surgery in March of 2020. Ironically, like three days before the world shut down. So, oh wow, oh, yeah. and how how has it been like trying to rehab that and like come back from that? Uh, it was very hard at first, but it wasn't as bad as uh, I expected. Like going through it was really shitty, and it sucked, but. I've danced different because of it. Like it challenged me in different ways. So mm. it was almost like a beneficial experience in some sort. Yeah. Cause you did like a pistol squat, like yeah. shoe move at the get off. I was like, isn't her leg broken? Like what that is she was doing? On the good leg though. I could ah. never do that with the other one, but yeah. Ah, a little trickery on the slide of hand yeah. there. Okay. Uh, yeah, because, oh, my God, I had a – I kind of had a shoulder injury that took me a while to come back from here recently um, yeah. and just strained it real bad. But, dude, I was so scared. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Like, I think it's over, guys, because, I could, like, I couldn't even lift my hand. Like, this sometimes still hurts, but I couldn't lift my hand over my head. And I was like, oh, no. Like, uh, this might be done. I might be done, boys. This sucks. Mm -hmm. See, most people don't want to take the time to like rehab and rest, but it's literally just dance. And if you rest, you get back to it. And like I'm, I can probably, like I'm stronger than I was before the injury. I can use it more. Like I'm more aware of everything because of it. Like you literally just have to take the break. Mm. And you don't think that, uh, you don't think that that injury had any kind of effect on your mental during the time for sure oh my gosh when I found out it was torn I cried because I was so pissed off that it was, like, <laughs> done for um and the process of coming back from it was super frustrating like I wasn't active for months because like fear of re-injury and all of those things so like throughout the process my mental was super fucked but now like it's in a much better place than it was ever before the injury and do you ever get like nervous when you're out there dancing about maybe like straining it or re-injuring, re-injuring yourself? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's more so like when I first started getting back into it now, not so much because I feel like I'm very aware of my body. Mm. Uh, but like when I hear it crack because like the scar tissue and everything like that, every once in a while, I'm like, oh, there it goes. Like, uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, so and that was um and that was a big thing too that i'm because like i even had a uh, i had an interview with namix and namix i guess is dealing with a lot of leg mm -hmm. injuries and stuff like that and i've been telling like and i was telling like dude just you know rest up like crump will be here mm -hmm. like and he's dumb young too i think he said he was like 22 or 23 years old mm -hmm. so it's like bro you got a long time i look at disco and pun like oh my god bro we got a long time still in front of us so yeah, when you're young, though, you think that, like, like it feels like that is the time. Like, you don't realize how much time ahead of you you have for all these things. And I'm 29, and I'm, like, I'm young as shit. Like, I have the rest of my life. I, my body's still good. Like, just take the break. Why did I think you were, like, 25 or 24, too? Why did I think that? Thank you. No, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, don't, don't, well, don't say that. Don't say that. Older. Don't say that. There we go. And 24. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I turned 32 this year, so let's not start throwing that O That's word around. Too. Yeah, we're not we're not using the O word just yet. Yeah. I'm still I'm still a young man, uh, but no. And 
And even in, you know, like the little bio that you had me send over, I seen that you're a therapist. And so what kind of, what kind of work do you do with that? Like on your day to day, are you treating patients? Do you just kind of? Oh yeah. I see clients every day. Sorry. Let me just turn my uh, vibrate off my phone. Um, I work at an intensive outpatient therapy clinic. So we have clients who are there for five or six hours a day, five days a week um, with like very serious, severe mental health issues. So I do therapy for like five to seven hours a day. Oh, wow. And so like, Oh my God. It's like, so are some of these people like when, oh God, I don't even like saying like that, but when some of these patients are coming to you or like, are you getting them like while they're in the middle of crisis sometimes, like they're having full blown meltdowns. Mm-hmm. Ooh. And how was that? Like, how was that on you on a day to day? Uh, I mean, you kind of learn how to get used to it and you can mm-hmm. either deal with it or you can't deal with it. And that really is what contributes to like getting burnt out or staying in the field. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have to have really good boundaries. You have to know crisis intervention. Like you have to be able to regulate your own emotions. And then at the end of the day, like you're exhausted every single day, but like you learn how to separate your own shit from like your clients at the same time. True. Oh my God. I used to work. um, I used to work in a group home with with six juvenile boys Mm -hmm. oh boy (laughs) oh oh man and my favorite kind of kids though they are they're great but Mm -hmm. i had no like training for that i barely i didn't even study for it i was lucky to not need any kind of real background for it i just knew how to work with kids and so i was able to have that kind of position um I mean, in that sort of job, though, that's really all they need because they get so much clinical everywhere else. Like you just need people to treat them like people in that sort of environment. True. Very true. Very true. And and you went to school, though, for to be a therapist and all that, correct? Yeah, I'm in a doctoral program right now. So. Okay. Zona State. Zona. What school? What school are we going to? Arizona State. Sun Devils. Go Devils. Ah, <laughs> go Devils. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I skipped the college part. That would just, I, I, I was good in school. But then once I got to like, you know, the whole college era, I was just like, yeah, I'm a dance, you yeah. know, I'm going to just do this dance and stuff. And I was on AOV around that time too. Yeah. And which was like, dream team you know so i was like dude fuck yeah. this i'm i'm out like i'm i'm doing what i want to do uh, right but i do kind of regret it now though i won't lie i so big props yeah. to you for doing the doing the school route because it's not for everybody i don't mm-hmm. think um it's also not too late to go back though you're only 32 i will be 32 this year yeah yeah, yeah. young so much time You sound like a lot of my friends, and I don't like that. Okay, (laughs) that's no, no, you're no, you're good. College definitely isn't for everyone, though. Like, if I wasn't in a career that required college for me to do my career, like, oh my god, fuck that! So much money, so much time, like, stupid. When did you, when did you feel or figure out that that was like the route for you? Like, like therapist, this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, I didn't until I was in it. So I didn't want to go to school. And my mom was like, you're going to college and me being 18. I was like, darn, okay, I guess I'm going right. So I was in college, I started with a different degree than what I was what I am now. And Hmm. then ended up switching to sociology only because I didn't want to have to do internships. And then at the end of it, I was like, fuck it. I'm going to be a therapist. And then luckily, I love it. Wow. Yeah. It, I, that's, that is kind of inspiring to hear because that, I think, is what's been challenging for me is, is how am I going to go to school when I enjoy so many things? Like, mm-hmm. I can't just buckle down to one topic. I, my, my attention 
is not even goldfish level. I, it's whatever's below, just below a goldfish is right there. Cause I yeah. like to pick up one book and start reading. And then I hear about another book and I'm like, Oh, let me get that one. And then I'll start reading that one and then try to double back and then pick up a third book because somebody else said this one was interesting or I seen it on TikTok. It's like, Oh, this book looks cool too. And I just like learning about different stuff. So that's why I do like doing the podcast, get to talk to cool people, yeah. all kinds of different kinds of people. Well, if it's comforting, I'm the exact same way. I finish nothing that I start, I guess, besides my education. So, <laughs> hey, that's one hell of a thing, though, to make sure you finish and see yeah. all the way through. Yep. <clears throat> what is it? What is it like to balance, you know, the school life, therapy, obviously? I mean, for people who don't know, like dealing with people on a consistent basis and even like you were saying yourself like there's people who suffer from burnout you know and don't stick stick to the field and these things and then to also be a part of the dead end fam which is mm -hmm. that's the end fam like people who don't know like dead end that end family is one of the one of the top tier fams i personally think in crump and is definitely running the show in Zona for 110%. So that's not a short order in itself. How do you, how do you juggle all of that? How do you find balance in all those, those different hats you wear? Um, that's a really good question. Sometimes I don't balance it well. Um, sometimes I do. It really is just like taking it day by day. I try really hard to get ahead of like the things that I can while I can, um, just because like you don't know what's going to happen in your day to day. Um, I listen to my body. Like when I'm exhausted, I don't talk to people. I don't hang out with people. And then when I do have like that energy and time, like I go for it. So it's really just taking it moment by moment. Because if I tried to like plan out my life, I don't think it would be possible. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. There was a, uh, there was a saying me and Sherwin had got, got to telling each other during COVID. Um, we were both going through a lot in life and I mean like the world, you know, like the world yeah. we were all going through it. And um, I remember I was telling him, I was like, dude, I'm living my life in eight hour increments. So if I could just get through the next eight hours with whatever is just right in front of me, then that's a success. And then I'll get through the next eight hours and then the next eight hours and kind of reassess, like you said, like assess, like, how's my body feeling, you know, not, not feel so pressured to like lap or feel so pressured to get this done in the house or, you know, get so much done with, with the kiddos or whatever, you know, whatever I got going on. Oh, so uh, one thing too, I was talking about with Casey and I want to see how I can say this right. So it doesn't sound so, so grand is, is I started this podcast around the, that time too, or I kind of started doubling down on the podcast around COVID mm -hmm. um, just as like people checking in on their mental health. So one thing I've noticed is is that we like to we like to talk about like oh check in on your people and and all these things but what is something that you would hope to see like let's just say in the crump community specifically what would you like to see more people in our community doing to like check in on each other or do better so they can be better in a mental space that's almost hard to answer because I don't think you can say something for like the entire community because it depends on like the subculture of the community right because mm. you have culture and then you have the subcultures within the culture so you have Texas and when you see Velocity and all of them and their stories like they're a family they're hanging out they look like they have a good check on their people that's what we have in Zona. Like I know that I can call Ronnie and he would be there for me in a heartbeat. Like he checks in on me. I've had an exceptionally hard week last week and he's checked on me like every few days, making sure I have what I need or um, to be with me if I need it. So, uh, I mean, 
I have a lot of opinions about the Crump community and what the Crump community needs, uh, but it really is like, without this sounding, sounding bad, like authenticity and accountability of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. What you think the community needs, you need to do because you don't have control over anyone other than yourself. So you can say like, everybody needs to check on their people, but you don't actually have any control over that. So are you checking on your people? Like, are you creating that in your community? And if everyone's doing that, then something that's needed to change will change. Wow. Like, it's kind of like that saying of like, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, mm -hmm. you know? And there's, there's kind of been this thing I've been harping on myself about is, is, how could I ask of somebody what I can't provide to myself, mm -hmm. you know? And I've, I think I've noticed that a lot with like people's <clears throat> more like romantic relationships, you know, they want their partner to be X, Y, and Z. And it's like, mm -hmm. but are you even that to your, are you your own safe space? You know, you want your boyfriend or girlfriend to be the safe space. It's like, are you your own safe space though? Can you sit alone in your own thoughts for 20, 30 minutes at a time? Yeah. A lot of people can do that, you know, but yeah, like be what you want to see type of thing. And sometimes you can give people what you can't give yourself and vice versa. Like I get things from people around me that I don't necessarily like have for me, but it's really just like giving what you can when you can. And mm -hmm. if you want to, because it's if, if it's inauthentic, like you're just adding to the mess of shit. Mm, that is true. Because I, that's true. I've never thought of it that way, that there is things I think, you know, we find ourselves in certain friend groups where these people do serve a certain piece of the part that we lack, you know, like yeah. the, the buddies who, you know, I got buddies who are super reserved and they don't laugh very much. They might giggle from time to time, but they're just my quiet homie. And it's like, this is somebody I could be quiet with. I don't have nothing to say but I could pull up and we just sit quietly, watch some TV or mm -hmm. go bullshit somewhere, you know? Yeah. That's, you know, cause obviously I like to talk. This is a fucking, I do a podcast. Like, you know, I obviously like to talk. Oh man. And another thing that I was hoping to talk with you about is, is, you know, I had knives on and this was during a time, this was around a time where there was a lot happening with crump and you know big homie got dragged into it shit got weird mm -hmm. and um i even had to check him myself because i have a daughter and a list of sisters and nieces and cousins and it's like bro hold on let's let's talk let's let's iron some stuff out mm -hmm. and so for women's spaces what is something that maybe let's let's get real specific then what is something that you would hope to see us men do for you right or do for you in particular so that you don't have to worry if you're in a safe space or just be your authentic self while you're out on the road or even home in zona dancing so this might be a hot take, um, but I, I actually it. don't think that it's men's responsibility at all. So within context, right? So this is this is as a grown woman, not talking about like children in any way, but as a grown woman, I'm aware of what I'm comfortable with, what boundaries I have, like I can tell when someone is who I don't want to be around, right? I get to choose who I give hugs to, who I say hi to, who I walk right past, who I engage in conversation with, and who I don't. So really, it's up to me to identify what a safe space is and then work on creating that. And that can come through like having conversations. I've had many conversations with my fam and my brothers about like people I'm not comfortable with, people I don't want to be around, and they can be like supportive and protective and add to that. But like it's up to me first more than anyone. If I don't know what safety is, if I can't put myself in a situation that feels safe, how's anyone else going to do it or support it? Whoa, that's a that is I don't think that's a hot take. I think that's actually really 
really insightful because there's dudes that I just won't find myself around, you mm-hmm. know, and maybe it's just because of their attitude or, you know, you hear certain people talk about certain topics and it's like, dog, nah, like, nah, 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 yeah. nah. Like, I'll see you at the session, bro. Like, I, I'll watch you dance and I'm going to cheer for you. But other outside of that, we are not going to Raising Cane's. We're right. not going to in and out, bro. Like, I'll see you later, alligator. Oh, my God. And yeah. so I think, too, I think a lot of people have a hard time recognizing safe spaces because for a lot of our life, we just really never had one. So mm-hmm. we don't understand what one really what one really is, which sucks. Yeah, for sure. But it's also not an excuse, right? Because Absolutely. you're no longer children. Like you do get to process, re-experience, create new relationships. So like my thing is men with good values will create a safe space without having to be told, right? Mm. Like Arizona is safe because Ronnie has values. Scrap and skills have values that I don't question, don't make me uncomfortable. Like their actions, their words, everything is just like aligned with each other. I don't have to ask them to make a safe space for me because of who they are. So you just really have to pay attention to things like that, in my opinion. Yeah, some of the, and I mean, listen, I don't want to sound like a fucking, I don't want to sound like a cheerleader for my guy, but there's a, there's a certain, there's a certain aura that oozes off of people like Ronnie that just ooze off of people like little rowdy, you know, and you just know, like, these are good vibes. These are good people. Yeah. And, and I know people can argue like, oh, well, you know, people can hide who they really are. It's like, yeah, but sometimes it's hard to hide who you really are too. You know, it just shines through. You can only hide who you are for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. Then you can't keep up the act anymore. Like true habits and behaviors come through no matter how hard you try to mask it. Mm, true. And even kind of doubling back is, is, I think as adults and, and, you know, I kind of, I came around the scene around 2016, 2017, and I didn't quite understand how long these people had known each other, you know, like the vets and the OGs. It's like, oh, you guys have known each other since you were children, like quite literally 14, 13 years old. And now we're grown and some of us have kids and have these careers and, you know, been married and divorced and you've, you've witnessed each other grow up. And there's this, there's this thing that I heard um, from a therapist where it was for uh, too often, too often we were, uh, what is it? Too often we rely on our past traumas to validate our current circumstances. And I was like, whoa, like, yeah, we like, we're not little kids anymore. I should know what disrespect feels like. And we're not little kids anymore. I should be able to regulate my emotions and not just cuss somebody out though. I mean, it happens, you know, (laughs) you know, I shouldn't just fucking wig out on somebody because they did something to me, or I should know what a safe space is or the people who are around me. Mm -hmm. I should know whether or not if they're safe people to be around type of type of vibe. So I really liked, I really, really, really liked hearing you say that right now. That was, that was good. Yeah. So something that you said is like, you should know, like not to validate that like childhood or upbringing is an excuse for things, but like you don't know until you experience it. So you have to put yourself in the position to where you are experiencing different than what you're used to. And if you don't know what that is, is starting to analyze your habits and behaviors or like paying attention to the people around you and deciding what you're okay with and not okay with. And like everybody has a million parts to themselves. The community has a million parts to it. You have to understand like where parts come from, maybe what it served at some point and if it's no longer necessary or helpful or beneficial and then let it go. Yeah, I, and I I think uh, I don't know what part of it is about us where we don't like to we don't like to attach like an expiration date 
to certain friendships and relationships. But it's like, dude, this thing is way past the expiration. Yeah. You know, if you left a fucking carton of milk in the refrigerator for three months, you would first off look at the date, like, and then take a little whiff. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. This is, I mean, I don't know if you're a milk smeller, but I am definitely a milk smeller. It's like, nah, dog. Nah, this is way past expiration, not putting this in the cereal bowl. Yeah. But it's like, we feel icky. Like, we can do that, you know, or we look through our vegetables for mold. You know, we look through meat for, for certain you know, implications that this is no longer good for me. I shouldn't be ingesting this. Yeah. But we won't do that with our, with our, with our friends or the people that we associate with, which is weird. I think that's a, I think it's a very strange notion that we do. I think a lot of it has to do with the concept of like loyalty or attachment and not being willing to let go of those things. Right. Because you want to like, you have this value and you want to prove this thing when it's really not doing you justice anymore. So the fear of like the change or how it would affect you or how you can be seen, even if it is necessarily for the better. Ooh. So do you think you can be so, do you think that people can be so loyal to someone that they're being like disloyal to themselves? A hundred percent. Have you ever experienced something like that? Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) Right. It's like, it's excusing habits and behaviors. It's accepting being treated in ways that you shouldn't be treated or spoken to. It's allowing things to be okay when like, you know that they're not like, okay, you're putting up with this person, but like ultimately you're hurting yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think um, like that self, it's like a self-sabotaging notion to be so blindly loyal to someone, Yeah, you know? Um, like even like, I love Sherman. I love Sherman. And there's been hundreds of times I've called him and been like, yo dog, I don't agree. I don't agree with this. Like, what are we, what are we talking about right now? Mm-hmm. And he knows that he knows I'm monster beast to the end, but I'm not a yes, man. You're like, uh, uh-uh, bro. Like if we disagree on something, I'm going to call you up and we're going to have us a nice, cool little, little chat about this, my guy. Yeah, but that's also like the difference in how you perceive loyal and other people. Right. Cause I'm going to do the same shit with Ronnie. Like I'm mm-hmm. going to him when I think he's wrong on things or when he did something great. And I expect the same vice versa. Like he said things to me where I'm like, Oh, you called me out. Right. <laughs> yeah. That is loyalty. Cause it's holding each other accountable. Like yeah. Not holding each other accountable. Okay. Yeah. There's there. I think, I think that's a big thing that I'm hoping to see more in the community because even even bless asked like what does accountability look like and though i don't know much about that situation and everything that happened there so i I won't really even speak to that effect but it did make me ask myself okay well if i'm holding someone accountable you know does this does the hammer come down equivalent to everybody that i know you know or Do I give the same grace to others that I'm hoping that they would give to me if I fucked up? And if I like, cause you said like, it's like, you can get called out on something that's like, oh, oh, bitch. Like, I'm just trying to be your friend over here. Oh, I'm just trying to do my thing. Like, sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. But But at the same time, you would hope that they would show you grace and kind of let you know, like, hey, your face is dirty. I love you. But, you know, you need to go ahead and get that cleaned up, my guy. Yeah. Sometimes grace isn't really beneficial, though. Mm -hmm. So, like, I don't necessarily think accountability has one look because you can't compare two drastically different situations in the same way, right? Like, punching someone in the face versus extreme harm. Mm -hmm. Like, two different things, accountability is going to look different. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the circumstances. Yeah, I think, um, and, and especially like what what we were even kind of experiencing just like less than a month ago, like it's gotten real quiet about that type of stuff in the Crump page. Mm-hmm. And I I go in there for my daily laugh. I don't I don't really go there for the drama. Like I just want to laugh, see some cool footage, you know, maybe scout some people who I can get on the podcast, and yeah. you know, I like to have a good time, but. When these type of conversations come up, I do hope that I can hope because even like you were saying, I can't hold everyone in that group 
accountable. Like you need to be doing this and blah, blah, blah. Like I can only do what I can do, you know? And so I'm hoping that this is a part of me taking accountability is having these type of conversations, you know, not just, not just with men, but with the ladies too of the, of our movement and kind of hearing what people what people got to say and really, really hear where their mind is on how they can feel safe or how I can make them feel safer, you know, mm-hmm. or what we can just do so people can be their, be their best selves at all times. Cause I think that's, I think that should be one of the goals is just be your best self at all times. I wouldn't use the term best self, but I would say like authentic self. Right. Uh, You don't always get to be the best version of you. You don't necessarily always even know what that is, especially if you're in a hard space or place, but authentic. Yeah. Ah, that is wonderful. Cause even, you know, we've been doing this whole 1% thing where it's like, you know, you, you might not be able to give a hundred percent of yourself to something today, but if you can give yourself 1%, like you, Mm -hmm. you did more than zero, given 0% effort on anything. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. I don't believe in the hundred percent thing either, though. I have. I'm so opinionated. Let's hear it. That's what we're here for. Sometimes, like fifty percent is your hundred percent, right? One mm-hmm. percent is your hundred percent. If you're meeting like the capacity that you have for the day, why is that not a hundred? Why is that mm-hmm. just one? That's true. That is true. That's very true. And you know, like this whole the whole hundred, like the whole one percent thing, came from a a Tony Robbins speech that I saw and it was saying, you know, people drastically overestimate what they can get done in one day and they underestimate what they can get done in the time of a year. Mm -hmm. So if I can just do 1%, right. If I can give you 1% today, that's 365, you know, return of investment over a year. And that's true. Like I didn't even, I didn't even think of it that way. Like if I, if, if I can give you, if that's all I got, like if all I got is this 1%, bro, that's, that's, that's what I got. That's, that's all I got, Captain. I'm, I'm giving it all I got. It's your hundred. Yeah. Cause that's, that's really true. Especially like even thinking about like dancing through injuries, right. And kind of rehabbing. It's like, oh, you know, my knees at, you know, 80%, but I, you know, I gave it all I got. I gave everything. That's your hundred percent. You know, and there's certain things, you know, and that's a literal physical like barrier and obstacle that you can't just be like, all right, me, let's let's get it together today. Like, no, 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 no. that's something you got to deal with. And so that is your 100 percent. I like that. I think it comes from a lot of things, too, though. So, like, I'm not very active right now. Um, I don't have the time Uh, working full time, going to school for full time with the doctoral program. Like I do not lab every day, cannot lab every day, but I show up when I can show up. I dance when I can dance. And that's what I give because that's what I have. And like, that's my hundred for now until like my situation changes. Damn. And how many hours are you doing at school? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They say that it's 16 hours a week for each class when it comes to like materials and homework and doing everything. So I have two classes at the moment. What's 16 plus 16, 32? Yes. Yes. Wait. I think yes. so. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not in school for math. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Oh, so, so 32 hours of schooling and then full time at the, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool. Yeah. That, you know, when you think of it, that's 72 hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 40 plus, plus 32. And then not to even consider like just going home and be like, all right, I'm gonna watch this show real quick. Yeah. You know, the decompress and kind of unpack for the day. Like, all right, all right, cool, cool. Got, got through that. Got through that. Yeah. Oof. And so, so kind of taking, so kind of taking a backseat with the dancing, it sounds like yeah. Fo- focusing on the school, all that, what would you hope to see this time next year? Where would you hope to see yourself with like your schooling and dance wise? 
I'm about to be in like the same position <laughs> next year because I'm going to be in school. I just started in January and it's like a two and a half, three year program. And I'm going to have an internship like a year from now. So I'm going to be working two jobs and going to school. So my life is going to be crazy. Two jobs? Mm-hmm. W- why? Because <laughs> you have to do an internship with this program. Oh, so the internship and then the the regular job and then the schooling. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Do you feel a lot of pressure thinking about that? Yes and no. Like I've done it before. This is what my master's degree was like and like exact same circumstances, full-time job, internship, school dance. So I'm like dreading it because it doesn't sound fun, but like I know I can do it and i didn't have to go back to school. I put myself in this situation. So kind of it is what it is. And you feel like you got a strong support system, like kind of cheering you on through it all? Oh, yeah. I have great people. Yeah, because I mean, Ronnie really be down for y'all. Like from all the pictures and just videos I see, he's always at like graduations and this event and that event. And I see all y'all tagged and I'm like, oh, man, man, be showing up. Let's go. You know, Everyone says that their fam is a, well, I guess not everyone. A lot of people say that their fam is a family, but like NFAM is a family. Like I've been with these people in the best moments of my life. They've been there with me in my worst. We've been there with them in their worst. Like it's a ride or die thing. Yeah. When, when I seen Ronnie at the bees camp that first time, I knew it. Like Mm -hmm. it's like, there's four of y'all. And Ronnie knew what was going to happen. Like, it's like, you know, you're coming from out of state. You guys are all going to end up battling. You know, Sherwin is real old school like that. And it's like, like, it just kind of made me think like this whole drive over, you know, he's talking about it. You know, he's like, hey, like, y'all better be ready. And it's like, no Mm -hmm. one cacked out. No one got all like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, no, they were ready. They were ready for war. And and that to me, that's I was like, oh, yeah, he's got a tight fam. He's got a he's got a real tight fam. I don't think there's anyone in the fam who would say no to like being called out or anything. I was really surprised with with Peyton the way that she went at Yaya because I think she had to be like fourteen or like thirteen at the time, maybe fifteen. And I was like, oh. I remember telling Dre like, oh, she acting like a, I was like, oh, she acting like a bully right now, bro. Look at her. She's like, she was all in Yaya's face. I was like, oh, let's, let's fucking go. Don't back down. Yeah. Don't back down. I like that. I like that. I like that war. I like that war when it comes to battles. Peyton. <laughs> Is she still dancing? I haven't really seen her around or, or anything like that. Uh, not that I know of, but. I don't really know, so I'm not one to speak on that. Fair enough. She's in college, you know. She is a young adult, so. Ah, it's so weird. I think of, like, Mahler and, like, Evil Ryu. It's like when I first met them, they were just, like, little – they were little kids. And then now it's like, dude, you guys are getting ready to graduate high school and some of y'all yeah. got – you know, I see them post pictures with girlfriends now, like, fucking <laughs> – like – uh, Ruck boy, good God! I first met him and he was fifteen. I was like, dude, now you're in college. Like yeah. you're in the, like you got facial hair now, bro. Like what the hell? Like where did the time go? So how do you feel about that word, old? <laughs> I don't like it now. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I don't. Yeah. I don't like it at all. Uh, it's it. I don't. I don't mind as much as like the getting seasoned like i'm i've i've got all this experience on me Mm -hmm. the thing that makes me that i hate hearing the word old is like it makes me it makes me reminisce on the things i've missed like what did i glance over you know even in all the moments that i was present with Mm -hmm. these people or my family what did i glance over what are these moments i'm not getting back that i was too busy on my phone or I was too busy being stubborn and not maybe not speaking to people that a simple apology or, Hey man, like, can I talk to you about something? You know, 
it could it could have fixed it or maybe we could yeah. be in a better place now type of type of feel yeah i get that but also why can't you do that in the future that's true that's true you know what i feel like a patient right now <laughs> <laughs> i feel like and and that's good though that's good because yeah. these are these are good questions to ask um yeah, I'm not a person like, like, don't get me wrong. There's things from my past I would wish I didn't do or I wish I didn't experience. But like all those things happen to get you exactly to where you are right now. Not that they should have happened. Not that it's great that they happened, but they did. And so now like you get to do things with that, with the future. And you either make changes or you go through the same habits and behaviors and you're the same person and it's just the same shit, different year. Like, ah, true, true, true. And, you know, I think about it a lot because I practically live in a hotel now, you know, with my job, I travel around and, you know, I'm bouncing around from state to state, blah, blah, blah. And like you said, I have, you know, I think unknowingly, but kind of now that I think about it is, is I am taking more time to when I'm with people. Like, I'm really trying to make sure I have solid conversations mm -hmm. or people who I say like, oh, you know, I could sit here and message a hundred crumpers and tell them how much I appreciate their art or, oh, yeah. like, hey, man, see you in the gym or uh, whatever, you know, but how many times do I really take a moment to hit them up on the phone and really talk to them be like, hey, like, how you doing? Like, are you, are you really okay? Like, like, are you really good? Like, really yeah. check in. Like kind of like what we we're talking about earlier, like check in. You want to see change in your life, really check in with people. It's one of those things you don't really think about earlier in life either, though. So like not to go therapist mode, but like when you're young and you don't have your freaking frontal lobe developed, like you're thinking so emotionally, you're not attuned to like what's going to happen as the effect that like now that you're older and you can process things in that way, like you have different values and experiences and expectations. So you do things different. It's not that you missed the things in the past, right? It's just you had a different perspective. Mm, what do you think has been a big, what do you think has been one of your biggest changes? If you could go back, let's say, what, the 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 mind is fully developed for, for most people around like 25, which I think is contested, but let's say what would you say would be a big change that you've noticed about yourself from 24 year old Stephanie to the now 29? I would never go back to 21 to 25 year old Stephanie. Like, Why not? That sounds like a nightmare. Like I was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I made bad decisions. Like I was in school and I was making good choices, but like I was not a good person. Like I didn't watch what I say. I was just like, I acted out of emotion all the time because I didn't understand my own emotions. So I think the biggest thing for me is like, I have had to do radical acceptance for like a lot of things that have happened in my life. I've had to do a lot of exploration of like my sense of self, who I want to be, who I feel like I am as a person and really exploring and understanding that has been the biggest change for me because now I act in alignment with like how I see myself, like from my own view versus other people's. Ooh, wow. Wow. Making, I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> making good choices, but making bad decisions at the same time. Because mm -hmm. younger me, young, young corpse would have said, no, life is, you know, black and white and this and that. You know, at 18, I was definitely a much different person. Yeah. And I think around i want to say around my 29th and like between 29 and 30 i started kind of having this idea of like two things can be true at once you know and you can be making good you can be making all good choices mm -hmm. but then at simultaneously making some of the worst decisions you could ever be making all in the same time yeah oh my god yeah and <clears throat> so if you if you could look back and you say, okay, you know, 20, 21 through 25, Stephanie, like, 
nada, like nada. What would have been one era of life that you that you would be like, yo, I wish I could go through that again. Like just experience that run one more time. I don't think I would want to for anything. Like I, I experienced my life and there's a lot of things that I'm like, those were phenomenal moments. But like the experience is what it is. And I want to leave it at that and experience new things. Mm, what is something you're hoping to experience in the future? Uh, a lot of things. And like, I don't know, you know, uh, I want to experience finishing school and being done forever. Yeah. <laughs> like the little day-to-day things that I'm most grateful for, for experiences, like the little moments that you don't know are going to happen with like your family or your friends or your people. So I don't even know really. Yeah. Yeah. There was, um, there was a, a couple months back. I moved from, from Cali to North Carolina, uh, packed up my car and drove across and, you know, was having a full mental breakdown on my way out and, you know, was just crying fucking hysterically. Yeah. And next thing I realized, like I was in another state and I was like, all right, I need to dry these tears because this great country is blowing right by me and I'm driving by myself of all things. I was like, just, you know, turn the music down, roll down the windows, just smell what this piece of fucking, you know, New Mexico, like just take a, take a nice whiff of what this air and what this looks like. And even drove through Arizona, um, you know, hit through Flagstaff and it was like, oh, this is the part where everyone says like, you know, be careful with your engine. Cause it's a, uh, you know, going through Flagstaff is so high up. It was like, oh, you know, be careful and this and that, like, oh, like, you know, kind of just taking those, those very, very small moments that go minute to minute, you know, second to second type of type of fill. Traveling though is, is something I'm hoping to do more more in the yeah. future. Mm. What would where would you say has been one of your like if you can how do I want to make sure I say this? Besides so let's say besides just even finishing school, what is like a dream, like what is a dream accomplishment that you hope that you could hang up on the wall one day? Mm. Well, I want to like be the top employee of an integrated behavioral health company. So like that is the dream career. And then everything that I can do in that position, like that I would plaster that on the wall if I can make change in the system of behavioral health. Mm. So. Change, would you like want to implement like new ways to handle like to handle patients or just change as in like like I'm that like I'm like I'm I'm that person. Like I'm that I'm that Kobe Bryant, I'm that MJ of the of this game. Not that. Like I'm just a girl. I'm really not shit. I'm just a person that like has an education and ask questions, right? But I want to break down systems and make them more effective because the systems that are in place for mental health care really ain't shit. So. How so? Um, in a lot of ways, access to care, um, getting into care, having appropriate level of care, insurance coverage, lack of insurance coverages, fees for services, policies, uh, rule outs for people who can even get into care. Like if you have this diagnosis, you don't get to be here. Like there's so many things that are restrictive when it's really meant to be something that's like supportive and beneficial. So. Ooh, yeah. In the group homes, it was, it was such a, like when I heard, when I heard the term aged out, I was like, well, what do you mean? And it was like, well, they're 18 now and they've hit a certain threshold and now they're, they're out like, whoa, what do you mean? Like, I was like, bro, I was just administering him medications. What do you mean? He's just out. Yeah. He was just here yesterday. This doesn't make sense. It's a fucked up system. Ooh, what would be, where would you start? Where would be your first start of your changes? 
Uh, that is uh, hard because there's so many things. Um, I think my biggest thing is like incompetency in clinicians. I can't stand somebody who is in a role who doesn't know how to do their role. Not because that they are themselves incompetent, but either they don't have the means, the support, um, the capacity because your caseload's too big. So really working on clinical competency. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. And I, and it, it was a weird thing, even like during, during, you know, the lockdowns when I'm hearing like, oh, I have so many patients. I had, I had a couple friends who had finished nursing school around that time too, which was, I, God, I remember getting phone calls. It was like, oh my God. I'm like, it's like, yo, yo, just hold on. Like, yeah. like, like sit down. Let's, let's walk through this. And that was something that they were saying was like, I don't understand how there's so many nurses but there's just so many people and they're just cramming it, cramming it down our throat, cramming it. And, mm-hmm. and I really, I really noticed it too. Like in the homes, it's like, Oh, you know, by like state law, you can have X amount of kids per employee. And they would really push that limit. So like if the limit was four kids per employee, they might be running you four kids per employee every single day and be like Mm -hmm. kind of make that like a standard and it's like bro you're pushing the limit though you're pushing people to their to their absolute brink yeah so if you hear of one therapist who has to see their clients every other week right that's the consistency of services what do you think a caseload would look like size-wise like how many clients would they be assigned they have to see him every other week. Maybe, maybe three or f- maybe three or four people. I don't know. May- I- I'm gonna say four. I'm 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 gonna I'm go four. So when I say the system is broken, when I worked in public mental health, which primarily was low income um, children in protective services, I had a caseload size of eighty. Wow. It's a broken system. Wow. 80 people. How do you even keep track? I have a list and then I try to say, who are you? (laughs) What did we talk about? Yeah. Oh my God. And you're keeping in, you're having to keep notes on these, on all these different patients and stuff. Oh, It would get to the point where I'm like, who am I seeing? And then I see their face and I'm like, Yes. And then you start to build the relationship and you know them, right? But at first, like, it's a guessing game. Oh, my God. And, you know, in, you know, just even from my own experience, which was so limited, I, you know, in comparison to yours, like building rapport with people who are in your care is, I think, nearly it's almost as important as the care that you're giving, literally giving to them. It's more important easily. You think so? Mm -hmm. You can't help someone therapeutically or in any sense if you don't have a relationship with them. It's like somebody who you really fucking hate and crump trying to give you pointers and you're like, why the fuck are you talking to me? Like, get the hell away Mm -hmm. from me, right? You don't have a relationship. It's just going to be words. Ooh, yeah. Like that that saying of uh, uh, wise words falling on deaf ears, you Mm know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And even, you know, my my son has experienced his first bully at school and me and his mom have had to convene on, you know, why. And we didn't realize until we approached the school about it, like the extent in which it had gotten to. And we're like, well, why? Why isn't he telling us certain things? Why isn't he like mentioning it more? And we kind of had to walk through it and it's like well first off he's changing you know he's he's growing up and you know they being a tattletale is a thing you know yeah. you know in kindergarten being a scaredy cat is like such an insult you know it's like heartbreaking and so it's like he's going through that phase one so talking to mom and dad isn't going to be a thing mm-hmm. like that anymore and we also had to kind of unpack like oh he did try to mention this and he did mention that, and we just we weren't hearing him. 
which may have affected our rapport with our own son. Yeah. And so now it's like, now he's not telling us certain things because maybe he feels like we're not listening to him. Mm-hmm. So when he speaks, like, let's make sure we're listening. Like, a hundred percent listening we can't just be like oh baby you know eh, 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 eh. you know yeah. parent chit chatter like no like really he's he's telling us something right now and we should probably listen yeah yes, absolutely it's hard though because like as an adult you expect other adults to like verbalize communicate like use assertive direct conversation like kids don't have that so you have to learn their language like you're saying like they only have the emotional part of their brain developed and so it's going to come out through action or um like change in affect and behavior versus like this kid's doing this because it doesn't necessarily connect like that Mm -hmm. and even with adults too i've and I think it's where I've been able to be more patient recently is, is, um, (laughs) and especially I'll say, especially in certain select groups amongst several communities (laughs) is, is, uh, they do have the emotional capacity of a child. And I have to remind myself of that. You said it. (laughs) Hey, I told you, I told you, I say what I want on this podcast and I I don't quite care. Yeah. So going back to your question of like what I think the community needs, I think that I would say a lot of people think that crump is therapy and crump is expression. It's a release. It can do some things that are therapeutic, but it's not therapy. And a lot of motherfuckers really should be in therapy. Yes, absolutely. And me and Casey were talking about it uh, yesterday where I tried to rem- remind myself that th- that some of the dancers and just individuals, period, they're at one moment, they were, you know, these tiny little babies who had no control of their motor function, no control of their mm-hmm. feelings. And we like to think that just because we grow up, that we like to assume like, oh, this person has control over their feelings. They have control over what they're going to do and say. And it's like, no, some of them don't. They haven't been given the proper, they never learned the proper tools. They yeah. never, you know, had the proper outlets for certain things besides crump. Like this was yeah. their thing. And sorry, buddy. No, all, all it's teaching you is that you can let this out for 30, 45 seconds and then, the, and then that's that where some of these conversations, like we're an hour into this conversation, like some yeah. of these conversations take time and you got to dedicate some time to it. Yeah. I mean, I think crump can give you more than just like 30 or 40 seconds of release, depending on what you're looking for and what you take from it. Right. Because you can mm-hmm. learn a lot from community. I think that a lot of healing is done in community versus alone, but it's really like, People have to stay in a place of like curiosity and exploring, like figuring out what you don't know, because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know that you can't regulate your emotions until you start to explore if you can regulate your emotions or like how things could look versus how they do. You can do a lot of that through crump and movement, depending on like how you specify your lens. But a lot of people like don't look at things that way. Ooh, and and it's very true. And it kind of what you said, too, about how the community and being around Crump can serve a certain outlet. And it's very true where I remember there was a minute in Crump where I, I pulled up to a session and I remember looking around and thinking, like, no one knows what I'm going through right now. Like, no one has any idea this battle I'm battling inside my head. And I still remember, like... B Buck coming up to me like, yo, of course, what up, man? Hey, bro, it's good to see you. Like, I love you, man. Like, you're always a good vibe. And I'm like, dude, I'm not even my best self right now. Like, I'm not even like I'm at 20%. And like kind of earlier, like, if but if 20% is all I got to give, and they still enjoy that from me, like, oh yes, yes, like, dude, just wait till you see me at a hundred. You're gonna love me even more. Like, dude, just let me get there. And that's true, because that that was a sideline conversation i was having with my guy you know what i mean and and it did a lot for me Mm -hmm. 
you are a therapist. I like that. I, like that. <laughs> really I don't does. even really hit you with anything therapeutic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, definitely make it definitely. And I hope, I hope whoever tunes in has tuned in or will play it back. I hope they can hear some of these questions and some of like how we've had this like ping pong ball going back and forth. Mm-hmm. Because I think, I think another issue that we kind of suffer from not only in Crump, but like majorly in society is, is that we kind of fall into these weird echo chambers where when we speak to somebody, we're not having, we're not having a solid dialogue of like, well, well, have you thought of it like this? Or have you seen it this way? Or, you know what? I might not, I might not fully agree with that and kind of get this back and forth to make people think and kind of invigorate the mind. Yeah. People, yep, they don't. <laughs> people, I mean, it's really when people like to be closed-minded, though, or when they're comfortable being in the way that they are, which isn't always wrong. Um, yeah, but you definitely learn and gain more when you're at least curious about what somebody else is saying. You don't have to take it for what it is, but just, like, hearing it. Yeah. Yeah, there is a, oh, there is a sick comfortability and misery that I've noticed. <laughs> You know, and it's not, it's not good. It it makes me sad when I see it. No, but like it does something for people, right? Because so being in misery, like it being in misery is not comfortable, but there's something more comfortable about being in that place of discomfort that you've been in for so long than trying to experience something new because you don't know what that new experience is going to be like. Like, you know what the misery and what the discomfort is and like you get used to it and you have like these maladaptive coping and like means for it. But like that new shit, you got to figure something out. Like that's scary. Maladaptive coping. (laughs) Unpack that. That was a lot of that was a lot of smart words. (laughs) Yeah, that was a therapist. Uh, So coping skills, things that get you through things, right? Maladaptive is when you take it and use it as a means that's not healthy. So like maladaptive coping skill is someone who is becomes an alcoholic because you're using alcohol as a means of like coping with your feelings, but it's not actually coping. It's digging you that deeper hole. Oh, yes. Now, and I've, I've been very open about it on, on the podcast and, you know, I'll, I'll scream it from the mountaintop is, is people who succumb to drug addiction, no matter what, uh, I'm not a doctor, but it's so hard for me to sit and say like, Oh, you know, it's because of genetics or it's because of this and it's because of that and because of this and because of that. What I can speak of on my own experience is, is once I quit drinking, And once I stopped smoking like weed on the regular or nicotine on the regular, I realized like there's certain, there's certain aspects of my life that I never really learned how to deal with. Like drinking was a quick relief to like, especially when I was working in the group homes, I was an alcoholic. Um, So I didn't know how to unpack that. And so once I quit drinking, I would feel all these emotions and be like, like, oh man, I need a drink. Like I need, I need, I know I need to throw down a shot. And it's like, no, 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 no. Actually we need to sit down. Like we need to sit down and kind of let this be what this is and feel, feel it, you know, but that was scary. Like you're saying, like it is the feeling of just saying, oh, I could pop the top and have a swig is, and I know what that's going to do to me. I know how that's going to make me feel in the morning. Yeah. But to deal with it, you know, sober and clear minded was way scary. And it was, it was a process. It was definitely a process. Yeah. It just feels easier in that moment, even if you know it's not right or it's what you're used to. True. Oh, man. Oh, man. Stephanie, thank you. Listen, listen. Thank you. And, and congratulations on your schooling and congratulations on everything that you're doing with that for real. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask you a question now? Absolutely. Because you got to ask questions about women and safe space and crump, but what are your thoughts and like men's mental health and crump in the community? I think that there is a bunch of oversized children 
who think that they are adults and that's okay. And I think, and, and I say that because we, I would say majority of the men in our, in our community found some kind of validation through whether it was gangbanging or they found validation through sports or they found validation because they could just simply beat somebody up. They could overpower somebody, which is, you know, okay, cool. That's how you found your validations. Mm -hmm. But that all falls very short when we hit, when we hit certain areas of life of like people passing away. Right. And how are you going to cope with this, bro? You know, because for most people that you disagree with, you will, you know, result to saying, hey, let's just battle. You know, I can battle this out with you. And just because you may be more talented in this sense doesn't change what the principle of the situation may be, right? Whatever disagreement or whatever, or you might be frustrated. So you think that because, you know, somebody passed away that you're just going to battle everybody until the feeling's gone. And that's not going to happen. That's mm -hmm. not you. Eventually, you're going to have to address that sorrow. And so there's a bunch of there's a bunch of young men who who just don't they they don't have the proper outlets. And for whatever reason, we have an issue with trying to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like it seems unmanly for whatever that might look like to somebody, or it seems weak to ask for help. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's one of our, our biggest issues that we face like mentally is, is seeking the, the proper, the proper guidance and being able to ask for help. So do you think that men's mental health is advocated or discussed enough in Crump? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, on that front, I think Crump to me is almost like when the inmates run the asylum. <laughs> they have taken over and they are running the asylum. And there is a few, few of the people who are of sound mind and of good character who can blend in with the madness. Like we can blend in with all you psychos. But the psychos are running the show right now. And I think we're starting to see a small pendulum swing of guys starting to get together and be like, hey, no, 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 no. We're not doing this. Like, we're, we're going to talk this out. We're going to have a conversation. Um, but no, I think there's no advocacy um, publicly, at least. Mm -hmm. I don't because I don't know what private conversations people have, but I'll say on a public stance, not enough, clearly not enough. No. Yeah. So like women and what we can do for women in my perspective, gets talked about more than what we can do for men in Crump uh, for some obvious reasons. Um, minority in Crump women are not around as much as men. Um, men are overpowering like those sort of things right but what do you think it would take for it to be more of a conversation for men's mental health mm. it sucks it sucks to say this i hoped that when we lost twitch i hoped that the conversation would shift because he succumbed to his own thoughts and his own demons. And he was such a special, you know, from the few times I really got to be around him and meet him and, and share presence, like he was such a special person. And I was hoping that it would kind of shift the tide. And it sucks that the conversation, you know, you, you see the post of like, Hey, check on your people, man. Da, 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 da. And then if, fizzles out and so i'm again i'm trying to do this podcast and really kind of promote this especially with crumpers and i encourage everyone to come on and talk or start your own podcasts and talk about it or 
you know, maybe we do a mindset Monday in the crumb group. Val, there's a perfect fucking post for you every Monday um, where we do mindset Monday, you know, and everyone just kind of, we can talk for a second and kind of really check in on each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause there is clearly mental health issues happening inside the community on the men's front for sure. But on the women's front too. Um, Yeah. A lot of, like a lot of tough conversations that are happening amongst small groups that I think deserve to, to have its time in the forefront. Like we should all be talking about this right now. Like, yeah. and it sucks cause it's kind of like putting people's business out there type of feeling. Mm-hmm. But somebody has got to break a headline for us to really get chit chatting about what we need to talk about. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't even think it's necessarily like putting someone else's business out there, but like your own vulnerability to like be a part of the conversation. Right. Mm, yeah. So obviously I'm not a man. I can't speak on the experience as a man, but like men typically are not as vulnerable for whatever reason. Um, and really to have those conversations, it takes like an extreme amount of vulnerability, which is uncomfortable. But well, one thing is, uh, Like, I know my dad fought in the military, and then my grandpa was a part of World War II, you know? So vulnerability, I think, becomes associated with being captured, you know? Mm -hmm. You're leaving your blind side open. You're vulnerable, you know, like like to, to to an attack where I feel like, you know, because hurt people hurt people, and- You learn how to cope with things generally, you know, with the people you're around, you know, their level of being able to cope generally, you know, again, I'm not a professional, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, You learn it from your environment and the people Mm -hmm. that teach you these things. And so I think a lot of us come from a, come from an, an upbringing where, especially for us men, where it's like, we're taught being vulnerable is, is saying like, you're you're not on your game or you're opening yourself up to an attack, which is kind of true because if you put yourself out there saying, Hey, this happened to me, you know, you get the, well, you should have done this and you should have done that. No, that's your fault. And it's like kind of victim blamey almost. Yeah. And a lot of people, I don't think, and that's what sucks for girls, you know, that I've noticed where it's like, you know, they'll, they'll try to bring something forward and then it's like, well, what did you do? Well, what did you do this? And this, this is that instead of us saying, Hey, that that's fucked up. What happened to you? What happened? What did you do? You know? And how do we, like you said, how do we make sure that you create a safe space for yourself? Yeah. But then how do we trim the weeds around you so that there's not snakes around us 24 fucking seven? Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that, like, vulnerability being just, like, open to get hurt. But I also think that's where, like, vulnerability with boundaries and preparation and support comes in. Like, you don't have to put yourself out there and vulnerable without having, like, a system in place for your, like, to still be okay through it. Mm, True. And I think there needs – I think – Cause we're even kind of saying too, like about children, right. Learning how to speak their language. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another thing that us men can do better for women and maybe even women doing for men where there's certain languages, especially in the crump community, like the do well, the men who associate in the crump community. Let me try to be specific on that one is that there's a very certain language that they speak and like literally like quite literally the words they choose and i think that when we approach some of the conversations we can do well with learning how to speak the language especially like with vulnerability they think oh that's you know that's that's for girls that's that's so feminine it's like but bro you have tattoos all over your chest and your stomach you were half naked while another man was touching you <laughs> laying on a on some table somewhere and he was literally scarring up your body Like talk to me about being vulnerable. Like, I don't like, yeah, I don't like that. We have this, such this disconnect just because of the word itself. You know what I mean? That's also throwing 
phrases that are human experience into socially defined terms, though, because femininity femininity is a socially defined term. Like my femininity could be totally different than lady end or lil end and masculinity, Mm. like from person to person, like it's just a social construct. Ooh, okay. Hmm. I would, you know, there's been a lot of debates, especially because I have, unfortunately, uh, discovered TikTok lives and there's a lot of debates on there and I get sucked into them all the fucking time. And you know, this thing of social constructs and social constructs. And especially when it comes, me and one of my buddies argued about this until we turned blue in the face, but I stand on it is, is I believe every man has a certain level of femininity to them. Right. And maybe it's not so, you know, it's, and again, it's like, okay, so what's femininity? It's like, huh? Like, well, I I don't quite know, but I know what feeling, what makes me feel like manly. I know that, like, I know what makes me feel super manly. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a divine balance that we have to be able to maintain because I think anybody who acts too manly all the time are, are fucking psychos. Those are the dudes who, you know, you know, they lash out just because somebody stepped on their toes, like quite literally. I think that's when you take a human experience though and place it into the category of feminine and masculine because emotions, every single person has them, but emotional is for women, right? Mm -hmm. And being tough is for men, but women are resilient too. So you're taking this human experience and throwing it onto a side when really it can bounce back and forth in between. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Cause yeah, some of who my, some of my sisters are some of the toughest girls I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Not just because they're my sisters. They're quite, they're quite tough cookies. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And resi- like, I think, yeah, I think too, too often we do rely on these terms to like really paint a definition of who we are and, and how we should behave yeah. and, instead of, just acknowledging yeah like the human like bro you're a human having a very human experience Mm and i'm and i'm here for you to i'm here for you to like let me dive into that with you like take me there you know and we say that in crump all the time take them there homie take them there like yeah like but we can't you can't tell me you can't do that with me off the dance floor you can't take me into your brain with you Uh, it's a, it's a tough conversation and it's, it's one that I'm hoping that I can stir around a little bit more. Um, Yeah. I don't think that there's ever going to be like a true answer on how to resolve it, what it looks like, because like that's all personal opinion. And like everything that I've said is just my opinion as a human. Right. But it just needs to be a conversation. Mm. Yeah. It's a, unfortunately, you know, mental health issues and whether it's everywhere from depression, anxiety, rage, like it's just a part of, I think of like our human conflict, this part of this human nature that we have. And as we advance, you know, like new problems pop up, you know, there's, you know, people say, Oh, well, we weren't talking about this 20 years ago. It's like, I know, like, you know, we should, but we should probably be talking yeah. about it now because it's a new issue that we're facing today. And so let's address it. And being, um, how is it? Being proactive instead of reactive to the things that are, happen- that are happening to us in our life, I think is important. You know, it's really, really yeah. important. Maybe even not being reactive, but being responsive. Ooh, how would you, how would you, how would you differ between the two? Because that's good. If you're reactive, like you're going off of emotion, you're moving very quickly on what feels right in the moment. But if you're responsive, you're taking the time to consider facts and logic and emotion and like a wise decision of how to move forward. Ooh. Ooh, making, ooh, yes. (laughs) Yes, taking in the facts to make sure that we make those right decisions moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, and... I think 
you know, I think too, we, we've seen with some of the situations through the crump community where there is something will be brought up and it's such a hot button topic. It's so, whether it's the intestines exploding or this person's doing this or that person's doing that, it's very, so emotionally provoking. And so you get everybody to start talking about it, which is cool. Let's talk about it. But once facts start being brought up, posts started getting deleted. And people who were once very advocating or this and that kind of start chirping off to the sidelines. And it's like, no, 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 no. Let's keep the same energy because we're already talking about it. You know, yeah. like we're already talking. We're already here at the table, bro. Let's just keep, you know, say sorry because you might have been wrong because you didn't have all your facts, my guy. Or yeah. you may have spoke out of turn. There's been times I spoke out of turn about a list of things. And I'm going to speak out of turn more because <laughs> I just, uh, this is who I am. Like, yeah. So, sometimes I don't have all the facts together. And sorry. You know, I'm not a fucking encyclopedia. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, and honestly, and this was, this was one of the, the big reasons too. Uh, I was hoping that I could get you on the show. And again, thank you for coming. Um, I think more people just need therapy. I uh, point blank. I think we need to remove the stigma around saying, oh, I go to a therapist or, oh, I got to check in with my, you know, my, my therapist today. I think we need to remove that stigma. So thank you for being in the community for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's also just not even, it's not just going to therapy, but it's finding the right therapist, the right form of therapist and like getting what you need from it. Cause therapy isn't just one thing. Like everyone doesn't go for the same thing. It gets tailored to you. You get out of it what you need if you want to. Ooh, that is interesting because we, I, oof, I got on a TikTok live and we were, they were having, oh my God, where they were talking about therapy and they were talking about certain, um, like one of them, uh, one dude was talking about how um, <clears throat> he was reluctant about having his kid, his kid study a sex education mm. and which got my ears to point up. And I was like, Ooh, cause you know, I got two small children. And once we started getting into this conversation, it was like, his issue wasn't about them learning, you know, the proper verbiage and the proper, you know, techniques of how to protect themselves, but it was who's teaching my kid, right? Like maybe this might not be the, the right person teaching my child, you know, cause every child is different and some yeah. kids, you know, everywhere from everywhere from, you know, young women who develop quickly, young men who develop quickly. Like I had a buddy in sixth grade who had a fucking full beard and yeah. I was barely had any fuzz in my armpits. It's like, bro, what do you mean? What do you mean you're 12? Your beard is at least 22. Like, what What are you saying right now? So yeah. even kids who develop differently or, or whatever, like therapists, I think, are just as important as just making – like who you pick as your therapist is, is almost as important as is making that decision to even seek the help. Yeah, 100%. Um, one rule of thumb is like, you should never actually know anything about your therapist. Hmm. Like there's some therapists who are more in the gray on self-disclosure than others, but like, you don't need to know jack shit about me. You're going to get my personality. You're going to understand how I work as a therapist, but like, you're not going to know anything about me. So Ooh, it's yeah. really just like who can create the best relationship with you and who can understand you the best. Mm. And it was, um, yeah. Cause I even remember thinking dealing with some of the kids from the, from the group home, it was like, there was so much to my life that they never knew. Like there was fucking so many things. And, uh, I remember I opened up to them one day about, uh, cause around the time I started working there, my, my dad had passed away. And when I opened up to them about it, they're like, oh, like I would have never known that. It's like, I know, like that's the fucking point, dude. Like you yeah. don't need to know these things about me. Like I don't know everything about you. Like mm -hmm. I just, I just, I know what I see. And that's what, yeah. I'm, what I'm getting from you right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a bar. Yeah. That's a bar. Uh, 
Yeah, there. I think, oof, especially people who uh, who say, "Oh, I don't need therapy." My antenna shoots up. I'm like, eh, "You, you probably do. You, you're probably the first person who needs it if you're that quick to respond." I won't say that everyone needs therapy all the time, but like it would probably be beneficial for a lot of people at certain points in their life. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a scary part too. Cause some people believe that, Oh, if I go to a therapist, I gotta do this for the rest of my life. It's like, nah, maybe just a few weeks or just go for one session. If I saw somebody for the rest of their life, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. What's, what's the usual I guess that's a good. I guess that's a good question too. Is is what's the usual time frame that you've seen, like a patient? Like, is it a few weeks, few months? Uh, it depends on what you're coming for and what you want from it. Like somebody who comes because they're struggling to quit their job and like need to learn communication skills is going to be drastically different than somebody who's coming from abuse and needs to like process and learn skills and do all the things. So it could be two sessions. It could be 27 sessions. It could be in between. Oh yeah. Because the spectrum, I, I don't, sometimes I don't even think about that. Like, Mm-hmm. the spectrum of of people in the the variations of their life that you may have to deal with on a on a case to case basis because it's quite literally case to case yeah and, oh man you get the people who want to gossip about their day and then you get the people who you're like oh my <laughs> gosh your life like well. uh, i i remember you know uh when my parents had split up, I remember we were going to therapy sessions and stuff. And I remember there being a couple sessions where I just, I don't, I don't even think I said anything to them. Just, you know, the, Hey, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Oh, how's everything? Cool. Dylan. Okay. With school. Sure. And that was that there was like no penetration to the next level. Like, you know, and it was just hard. See, everything you just said are words that I don't allow for my clients. Oh, really? So you said like some boundaries for them and like expectations? Oh, yeah. If you say the word good, try again. <laughs> what does that mean? What is good? Hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a thing where because I do a podcast on Tuesdays and one of our things that people who ten, tune in, they're like, let's unpack that. I like to say that. Let's let's unpack that. What is that? mean bro what did you just say right now like so yeah yeah, what's good what's what's short bro talk to me like what's what's going on here yeah oh my god listen i don't want to hold you up too long i hope we could do this again yeah maybe maybe after you get some more through some of your schooling do do a little check-in see how that's going um i do want to say though congratulations on on judging an event i know that's a huge that's that's a huge responsibility congratulations Mm -hmm. on all your schooling yeah, shout out and fam, all that. Princess Dead End is on the line. Yeah, gang, gang. Oh. Um, and and congratulations too for making your way back from an injury. You know, because yeah. I know that I know that takes a toll. Yeah. Um, but before yeah. before we sign out, is there any anything you want to plug? Any little quote of the night? You know, little gym you want to drop? Social medias you want to plug? You can take That's it away. Like storm five. <laughs> Pay attention. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, Desert Storm 5 is November 20th? Um, or we don't know yet. No, we know. Somebody knows. I don't remember. Sorry, Ronnie. Um, it's a really good question. November 19th to 23rd. Yes, I knew it. Because me and Ronnie have the same birthday. He's on the 23rd, November 23rd. So, yeah, me and it, I'm pretty sure his is on the 23rd. But I know it's close. And then I, I remember seeing something about it being around those days. So I might try to I might try to make this one. I'm, uh, right? It's tough. You know, my son's birthday is like 13 days after mine, 14 days after mine. And so I always end up with him. We go to Disney. Yeah. We do the whole shebang. Um, but yeah, no, I'll 
I'll say this. I will make a concerted effort into all of my capabilities and power to be there because I you need to be. I don't want to miss it. <laughs> like... Well, crazy enough is, is there is a young, um, a young girl. Her name is Olivia who's dancing. I think she's still dancing with jukebox now, or she was taking classes there. Um, and I hit her up. I was like, Hey, I was like, uh, cause she was interested in learning crump. I was like, Hey, hit up, hit up Ronnie. He's there at jukebox. Like, I see that you're taking classes there. You need to hit him up if you want to learn crump. Like he's the godfather of Arizona. <clears throat> and she said, Oh, you know, Oh yeah, I will. I, but I haven't, I haven't talked to her in, in, in quite some time. So I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping to go out there, see her, you know, I'm still really cool friends with her girlfriend. Um, and, her girlfriend is like really good friends with some of my little homies from Oxnard. So maybe make it like a whole fan trip, pull up, yeah. pull up out there and get, bu- get busy with it. But, uh, does storm, you guys heard it here. Does the storm be there or be square? Yeah. Steph. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Like for real. Thank you. Yeah. Like I've been telling everybody, thank you for being alive. Thank you for being in my life in whatever capacity that it's been and will be. Um, but yeah, I'll let you shake out of here and and I'll send you a message too with the with the link on all this and all that. Awesome. Have a good night. You too. Bye. You guys, Princess End. Princess Dead End. Seek therapy, people. Seek help. <laughs> if there was anything I hope that anybody took from this and has been taken from some of these podcasts is, is there's help out there, right? There are spaces for us to talk, fam. Like we literally have people in our community who are licensed, certified, educated in therapy, right? And it you've heard like the different wide variations of people who seek out help, anybody from needing help quitting a job and want to talk about it to people who are seeking deeper, 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 deeper root rooted, like issues with themselves. They need help unpacking it and, and bring some stuff to the light. Like there's that too. Like this podcast isn't just here for me to come along and talk shit and spit a couple jokes. Like I'm hoping people know that you not only have a safe space, Like you have a safe space with me to be your worst self, right? And there is a list and multitude of people in our own communities. A community, even though Crump feels so big, it is so, so small. And there's so many people inside this community who will take the time. They will take the time to hear you out. I will take the time to hear you out because life is better with you in it. Life is better with you in it. I promise you. Yeah, thank you all for being alive. Thank you for everyone who's who's tuned in. Thank you for everybody who's in my life, who will be in my life in whatever capacity that that we find ourselves in, right? Um, again, shout out Dead End. Shout out the Dead End family. Shout out Arizona. Answer your messages, motherfucker, so I can get you on the show. Um, but until next time, everybody. Hey, Steez, my man, my main man. Steezy. Hey, bro, I'm going to hit you up too. I want to get you on the show too, my guy. Uh, but you guys, this has been the Smoky Section. I'm your humble host, Big Corpse. Corpsecollection.com. You know the drill. But but until next time, I hope everyone has an amazing day. I hope you have an amazing week, month, year, and life. Until next time, I'll see you on the flip side.